This is Alaskan wilderness. It seems untouched by human beings. But for a brief moment in time, this valley swarmed with hordes of people. This beach was the gateway to men's dreams and men's nightmares. A hundred years ago, this was an isolated Alaskan trading post called Dai. Just a few dozen native families lived here. Then in 1898, Dai exploded into a frantic seaport. Tens of thousands of people, men, women, children, poured through here on their way north. Yet just a few years later, this was practically a ghost town. Maybe five or six people left. What happened here can be explained in a single word, gold. This is the story of the last great gold rush. It was crazy, it was a madness. It swept the United States and the world, and it all started in a place called the Klondike. Ordinary people dropped everything and headed north over towering mountains, through savage blizzards, down treacherous rapids, looking to find their fortunes in the Arctic. It was an obsession, a wild adventure, a stampede. It was Klondike fever. been here in these mountains for millions of years and for millions of years water ground these mountains down the fast moving streams tumbled the rubble down to where the water slowed and there the gold that had been locked up inside the mountains eddied and accumulated in the sandbars and gravel beds to the native people the gold was a curiosity and Russian colonizers and the English of the Hudson's Bay Company were only interested in the fur trade. But by 1896, there were thousands of tough, resourceful men prospecting the vast tributaries of the Yukon River. They came from every corner of the world. They drifted from stream to stream, living by their own strict code, and always found just enough gold to lure them on. One of those men was a Californian expatriate named George Washington Carmack. Carmack's wife, Kate, was a taggish Indian. Carmack had been working these valleys for 10 years recently with his in-laws, taggish Charlie and Skookum Jim. This was a hard life in tough, unforgiving country, and the shared hardship created bonds of trust between the prospectors. So it's no surprise that when Carmack met a fellow prospector, Robert Henderson, they shared information. Henderson was a veteran gold seeker. He told Carmack about a promising claim he'd staked on a creek off the Klondike River. He invited Carmack to stake a claim in the same area, but then he uttered the words that would haunt him for the rest of his life. But I don't want any damn siwashes staking on gold bottom. Siwash was a racist remark, what some whites called the natives. Carmack was put off by this insult to his in-laws, so we told Henderson they'd go it alone. He, Tagus Charlie, and Skookum Jim came right here to Rabbit Creek. This creek flows just a few miles down into the Klondike River, which then flows into the Yukon. To this day, no one is sure whether it was Carmack or his brother-in-law, Skookum Jim, who found that first nugget. Charlie! Whoever did find it, the reaction of the partners was the same. No one knew it yet, but gold fever 
was about to break out in the Yukon. Thousands of miles away in the United States, it was a curious time. On one hand, it was the gay 90s, Lillian Russell and Mark Twain, the Gibson Girl and the Floradora Sextet. But the fun and frivolity couldn't hide the tragic reality. America was in economic depression. Sweatshops and robber barons, tenements and foreclosed mortgages, hungry children and people starving in the streets. America was ripe for an emotional escape and a romantic adventure. Meanwhile, on August 17, 1896, George Washington Carmack staked a claim that would rock the world. Then he and his partners headed for the town of 40 Mile to record it officially. For years, a number of frontiersmen had been prospecting the Yukon. They were the old pros. They called themselves sourdoughs. Uh, sourdough was a kind of dough base. They wore a little bag around their necks to make bread. Well, the sourdoughs had a code. Do unto others as you would be done by. Carmack and his partners were genuine sourdoughs. So on the way downriver to register their claims, they told everyone they saw about the gold. For men who had spent years chasing after the big strike, even the barest hint of a rumor was enough to make them drop everything and race for the Klondike watershed. As soon as George Carmack reached 40 Mile, he headed for Bill McPhee's saloon. Carmack had a nickname, Lying George, and when he announced his strike, I've hit it. Everyone howled with laughter. Clarence Berry was the bartender. It's called Bonanza Creek. Off he whipped Klondike. off his apron and headed straight for what folks were now calling yeah, Bonanza right. Creek. Within a year, Berry was a rich man. About the only man Carmack did not tell about his strike was Robert Henderson. By the time he learned about Carmack's big find on Bonanza Creek, it was too late. Henderson spent the next 35 years, the rest of his life, looking for gold. Before Carmack's strike, a man might put a pan into the river, and if he pulled out 10 cents worth of gold from one pan, that was considered the sign of a rich strike. But on Klondike claims, that first season, pans were found worth $800. These first men lucky enough to hear of Carmack's strike and stake the right claims would be the first Klondike millionaires, instant celebrities. They were known as the kings of the Klondike and had the chance of a lifetime, the opportunity to transform their pipe dreams of fabulous wealth into reality. Gold fever was raging up and down the Yukon, and before long, it would explode on the outside world. Eleven months after George Carmack's discovery on Bonanza Creek, the real gold rush began. 5,000 people crowded on a Seattle dock, waiting as the steamship nuzzled the pier. The day before, the steamship Excelsior had landed in San Francisco with a ragtag bunch of gold-laden Yukon prospectors. The Seattle Post Intelligencer had been tipped off to this news and dispatched a reporter to intercept the steamship Portland due in from Alaska. It wasn't even 9 a.m., but an extra edition of the paper was already on the street. It was electrifying news. Ten of gold, ship to Seattle. Actually, it was two tons, but there was a near riot on the dock that morning and nobody was counting. Newspapers around the world picked up the phrase, ton of gold. The fact was, at today's prices, the gold on board was worth $28 million. Clarence Berry, the bartender from 40 Mile, walked down the gangplank with $130,000 in gold. Each miner on board became an instant celebrity with his own incredible tale of fortune. People looked at them and thought, why not me? The SS Portland was fully booked to Alaska before the end of the day. People literally dropped what they were doing to join the rush. 
The magic word, of course, was gold, and it launched a stampede. In the words of poet Robert Service, Gold we leapt from our benches, gold we sprang from our stools, gold we wheeled in the furrow, fired with the faith of fools, graybeard and striplings and women, good men and bad men and bold, leaving our homes and our loved ones, crying exultantly, gold! <laughs> Klondike historian Reed Jarvis. Beginning in 1893 with the panic, which was caused by a lack of gold in the United States, the country had gradually slowed down and everything, everything was sort of disappearing. Money was disappearing from the banks and being buried in cans and backyards because the banks were failing. And with the gold rush, it was an infusion of spirit which affected the money and pulled the money out of the ground and the banks and un from underneath the mattresses and invested in, in the great adventure going north. Struggling businesses and chambers of commerce up and down the West Coast saw the Klondike as an unprecedented economic opportunity. San Francisco, Vancouver, Victoria, every city wanted to be the gateway to Alaska, but not every city had an Erastus Brainerd. Hired by the Seattle Chamber of Commerce, Erastus Brainerd was one of America's first public relations men. He turned a small town into a gigantic money machine. Brainerd masterminded a tremendous PR campaign. His work found its way into how-to brochures, touting Seattle as the only town that could outfit you for the Klondike. It was Brainerd who asked the world, do you have Klondike fever? The national media was overwhelmed with a Klondike frenzy. One paper called it Klondike crazy. Thomas Edison dispatched a crew to record the gold rush with his new invention, the motion picture camera. These rare paper film images were taken in Seattle. I guess the only way to explain it, it would be as if we took uh, Super Bowl Sunday and the final four and rolled them all together. I mean, where this event was being held was in the Klondike, but the effect was felt all up and down the coast. The work of Brainerd and others made Seattle, turned it into the largest city in the Pacific Northwest. In less than a year, $25 million had been spent on outfits and tickets in Seattle, five times the amount in any other gateway city. An outfit cost uh, $500, to, so we're talking not about poor people just sort of migrating north. We're talking about syndicates. We're talking about people who have money enough to afford a year's travel. The outfits that the people were looking for are the high boots and the wool mackinaws and the hats and the gloves were conveniently made available from our local merchants. There's a story about the, the animals, the four-legged animals in uh, Seattle. Um, people realized that dog teams were the mode of transportation in the north. Uh, it didn't make any difference what kind of dog you had. As long as it had four legs and a little fur on it, people would capture them and send them north. People from the Midwest uh, would arrive by train uh, on the waterfront get off the train, there'd be thousands of people milling around, hawkers saying, if you're gonna buy an outfit, buy it from us, let me show your way around. And the first thing they had to do was get a ticket north. And you couldn't just get off the train and get on the boat and head north. You had to stand in line to buy a ticket, and the ticket might be good for next month or six weeks from now. The next thing you had to do was find a place to stay. And by early August, all the rooms in Seattle were filled. The Stampeders were a grand class of Americans, but it was this wonderful spirit of naivete that the, that the miners had that all they had to go was to the north and bend down and pick up the gold. Uh, some of them even brought gunny sacks with them so they could reach down and pick up the gold and put it in the bag and eventually put it in their shoulders and, and, and head south uh, being a millionaire. Caught up in the romance and adventure of the great Arctic quest, these would-be prospectors posed for studio portraits before heading off to seek their fortunes. Any man in a miner's outfit could be sure of handshakes and free drinks in the bars of Seattle. It was estimated that a million people announced their plans to head for the Klondike, but it was very expensive. 
Only about 100,000 actually began the journey. One of them was Harvey Condon, a small town banker, lawyer, and family man. He had never done any prospecting, knew almost nothing about where he was going, but like so many others, gripped with Klondike fever, he saw the stampede as his golden opportunity. So he left his family in Seattle and headed north with a promise to write off it. The Stampeders saw themselves as competitors in a kind of grand race, a sprint to get to the gold fields before all the claims were gone. None of them had any idea how long this race would be or how far they'd really have to travel before they could come home. Up and down the coast, any rotting hulk of a boat that could float was crammed with miners and provisions and pointed north. 42 ships were wrecked in these frigid waters during the stampede. Like most men, Harvey Condon took the cheapest and fastest way to the Klondike, steerage, up the inside passage to the Lynn Canal, a $35 ticket from Puget Sound. It looks so easy on paper. Take the steamer up from Seattle, a short hike over the pass, and then float down the Yukon River all the way to Dawson City, the fabled capital of the Klondike gold fields. Harvey's first stop was Skagway, one of the two jumping off points for crossing the mountains to the Yukon headwaters. The route from Skagway led through the White Pass, and Harvey tried to get some information about the trail ahead. December 2, 1897. My darling wife, we took in the town and think it is a tough place. I talked with a partner of a poor fella who drowned at the White Horse Rapids. He and all the fellas said that Dye is the best route. Well, Harvey was right about Skagway. A visiting Mountie said it was the roughest place on earth. Gambling, the liquor flowed, there was gunfire every night, and it was all run by an American gangster by the name of Soapy Smith. He was called the uncrowned king of Skagway. He had a personal militia of 200 to 300 thugs and con men. Uh, there was no end to the number of ways they could think of to lie, cheat, and steal, uh, especially when it came to the newcomers, the chichacos, they were called, fresh off the boat. Jefferson Soapy Smith came to Alaska for the gold, other people's gold. He had an easy manner, smooth charm, and convinced a lot of stampeders he was just the nicest guy in town, while his henchmen were bilking them out of their last dimes. But as Soapy would say, what they don't know, can't hurt him. Skagway's dirty reputation reached over the border into Canada. The Canadian authorities even posted a machine gun at the top of the pass to keep Soapy's men and their guns out of the Yukon. Fortunately, Stampeders had another port to choose for their landing. This is Dai. It's the other gateway to the Klondike. It's also on the Lynn Canal, and it's just three miles from Skagway. In its short heyday, it boasted 150 businesses, including 48 hotels, 39 taverns, two newspapers, and no decent wharf. For many, Dai became the first do-or-die challenge. Arriving stampeders saw their provisions dumped on the tidal flats nearly a mile from dry land. Those who could afford it paid Teamsters to move their supplies to high ground. Those who couldn't scrambled like crazy. But the tide was fast, it was relentless. Many unlucky stampeders saw all their provisions destroyed in the muck at Dai. The sea claimed many Klondike dreams. Harvey Condon and his partner had brought in their year's worth of provisions. A thousand pounds of food, a thousand pounds of equipment, a ton of stuff per person. They wouldn't be allowed into Canada without it. And now, they'd have to find a way to move all of it over the mountains and on to Dawson. December 20th, 1897. I come every night so tired I can hardly stand straight. Already one fella has sold his outfit for less than it cost and went back. I expect that a good many more will do so, but I'm going to stick to it, because I'm looking out for you and the youngsters. The route from here, the Chilkoot Trail, even though it's higher and steeper, then the White Pass is still a better way to go. Uh, more than half the people 
some 40,000 who reached Dawson came this way. The rest uh, went through White Pass. Uh, they trekked overland for up to a year from Edmonton, Alberta. Many tried to go over the glaciers above Valdez, Alaska. Many of them died. There was one more comfortable way to go, if you had the money. Uh, that was to steam up the Yukon River in a riverboat sternwheeler. From June through September, the Yukon River was ice-free and navigable from its mouth all the way to Dawson. But Harvey's $35 fare to Dye would have risen to $350 had he chosen the sternwheeler route. And with a river frozen solid, he would have to have waited on the Bering Coast until late spring. Money aside, most stampeders on the Chilkoot Trail thought they could beat the boat to the Klondike. In fact, those who left the states August 1st on the Sternwheeler route took a full 10 months to reach Dawson. Harvey noticed, to his surprise, that there were a lot more people on the trail than just able-bodied men. A good many ladies seemed to be going in, and they pulled just like a man. Today, a man about 65 and a girl about 16 went back and forth. Two weeks after they left Dye, Harvey and his partners were still struggling to get their 2,000 pounds of provisions up to Sheep Camp, which is still four miles from the summit. On Christmas Day, Harvey wrote to his wife. This was the worst day I ever put in in my life. Just imagine trying to pitch a tent with one and a half feet of snow and the ground so frozen we could not drive in tent pins, and snowing and blowing a gale in the dark. Harvey Condon may have had the worst day of his life, but he hadn't hiked the last four miles to the Chilkoot Summit. I mean, this is a challenge in the summer, but that winter, 70 feet of snow fell on the Chilkoot. Temperatures dropped to 60 degrees below zero. Each man had to make 30 to 40 round trips with a 65 pound pack. That meant that a man packing alone might hike a thousand miles on the 33 mile Chilkoot Trail. It could take three months. The stampede slowed to a crawl. Etched against the stark white of the snowfield, an endless line of tiny black figures trudged up the mountain. In less than a mile, the trail rose a thousand feet. They were doubled over with their heavy loads and moved in a swaying lockstep. A low, continuous moan of effort reverberated off the peaks. If someone stepped out of line, they could wait up to five hours for a break to step back in. This wintry vision of hell became the defining image of the Klondike Stampede. It was an image that the survivors of the Chilkoot Trail carried with them to their graves. On the steepest part of the trail, entrepreneurs hacked steps into the ice and charged to use them. So, for a fee, they climbed the Golden Stairs. It took six hours to make these last thousand feet. That meant it took weeks to get over the top. And Harvey, like many of the others, couldn't afford native packers, so he did it himself. Traditionally, this pass had been controlled by the Chilkoot Indians. It was the only way in or out of the Yukon. They charged a toll and offered their own services as packers. No one could match the Chilkoot for strength or endurance. They'd been raised from childhood to do this work. Ron Chambers. My grandfather, uh, his name was Klanot. He was one of the chiefs of the Chilkoot, ended up in a, in a battle over the pass with another chief from Sitka who came up and had some of his people carrying over the pass. And my grandfather was killed in that fight and uh, that kind of broke the monopoly of, um, of the Chukut on the pass. The um, Klingets were still the best packers around and uh, so the miners that were really serious about getting their material up to the top of the pass um, still hired them, and they made pretty good living as packers. January 7th, 1898. My feet and hands swell up every night. We come in every night with icicles and frost on our mustaches. We haven't shaved since we started. I wish I could describe the conditions here, but it is beyond me. I can only say I don't believe there is anything like it in the world. Today, the Chilkoot Pass is littered with the remains of the winter of 1897-98. 
Summer hikers can feel the ghosts of the stampeders all around them. Winters, this pass is abandoned. Park rangers report that even with all our modern hiking gear, no one makes this trek in winter. The weather's too severe. Even though it was steeper, the Chilkoot was still easier to cross than White Pass, the route out of Skagway. Stampeders couldn't begin to imagine what awaited them on the White Pass. Leaving Skagway, the trail was deceptively easy at its trailhead. Edison's film crew captured this smooth traveling pack train. Even a wagon could start on it, but quickly, a White Pass turned into a nightmare for both men and animals. Eventually, it became a traffic jam. The switchback trail was so narrow that nothing could move in any direction. Stampeders, impatient to get to the gold fields, whipped and starved their animals. Some horses were said to commit suicide by leaping off cliffs. At least 3,000 pack animals died of abuse. One Canadian official wrote about the horror. I saw a horse, stunned and starving, collapsed in the middle of the trail. I moved on. When I returned some days later, all that could be recognized of this poor beast was its rotting head and tail, its torso having been beaten into a pulp by the ceaseless traffic passing over it. Novelist Jack London, who later wrote The Call of the Wild, was 23 years old when he started across this pass. What he saw haunted him the rest of his life. London renamed White Pass when he wrote, Their hearts turned to stone those which did not break, and they became beasts, the men on the dead horse trail. None of the animals seen in any of these photographs survived the trip. And for the Stampeders, the horrors of White Pass were tragic hints of more to come. The worst was not over. This Chilkoot Summit is the U.S.-Canada border, but back in the winter of 1897, this border was in dispute. So the Northwest Mounted Police came up here to show the Canadian flag, but they also kept Soapy Smith's con men out of Canada and collected duty on every thousand pounds of provisions, and they saved lives. Canadian authorities quickly realized they'd have a humanitarian disaster on their hands if thousands of naive and poorly equipped stampeders were allowed to pour into the Yukon in midwinter. So they dispatched Samuel Steele to become the commander of the Northwest Mounted Police at the summit and to enforce the regulation that required each stampeder to have a year's worth of supplies, no exceptions. Their foresight saved many a stampeder from starving to death, and the Stampeders hadn't seen the last of Steel of the Mountain. The top of the pass became an outdoor warehouse. Supplies were buried under nearly 70 feet of snow, but on the summit, around the clock, the Mounties made the decisions, doing their duty for Queen and country. March 8, 1898. There must be now 5,000 to 7,000 people on the trail from Pleasant Camp to Stone House and over 2,000 loads of goods on the lake. But only a few have reached the lake. From the summit of the pass to the shores of Lake Bennett, the race to the gold fields ground to a halt. The Yukon and its headwaters were frozen solid. The Klondike stampede would have to wait for the spring thaw. March 8th. Picture in your mind a little tent on a hill with the wind howling and the temperature four degrees above zero. You see, it has commenced to get warmer here. There were a lot of dangers that winter, but few city men understood the danger of it getting warmer, especially back up on the pass. Come on! God, come on! Hurry! Hurry up! I found one! It's alive! Come on, here! Come help over here! Please help him! From sheep camp, a thousand men rushed to the rescue. 
In the days and weeks that followed, they recovered more than 60 bodies. Despite the tragedy of the Palm Sunday avalanche, few, if any, uh, turned back. Thousands pressed onto the Klondike. They had been artists and office workers, mayors, uh, streetcar conductors. They were tougher now, but they weren't there yet. They still had a 500-mile river trip facing them. The question was, how many would make it? From White Pass and Chilkoot Pass, it was downhill to Lake Lindemann and Lake Bennett. But the killer winter of 1897-98 stopped the stampede dead in its tracks. These two lakes are at the headwaters of the Yukon River. They were frozen solid. Some 30,000 people were camped out over 60 miles of shoreline. And they had new challenges, cutting down trees and building boats. Most of them had never done either one, and it was the boat building that separated a lot of friends. The next challenge they faced was turning trees into lumber. This was done with a two-man whip saw. The man below ate sawdust while the man above broke his back, and each man blamed the other. Lifelong friends became bitter enemies on the shores of Lake Bennett, and their rage sometimes drove them insane. Jim and I have divided up everything, and we will probably go it alone for a while. I got the stove and the grub box and the smaller tent, so I am all right. I suppose you will want to know why. Well, I will tell you about it some other time. The Mounties warned the Stampeders not to build floating coffins, then painted numbers on each bow in case they'd have to identify the boat by its pieces. The race was waiting for Mother Nature. On May 29, 1898, the ice broke. Within 48 hours, 7,124 boats passed this very spot. 30,000 worn out stampeders carrying 30 million pounds of food, thousands of tons of supplies on a 500 mile race to Dawson. And most of them had never even seen a rapid. For a time, the homemade boats floated gently down the upper Yukon. Stampeders had heard warnings, but few of them were ready for what was ahead downriver. This is Miles Canyon. It's peaceful and calm now because a dam raised the water level. But back in the spring of 98, 50 feet straight down there were the White Horse Rapids and the Squaw Rapids. Uh, 23 people were killed, hundreds more lost their boats, their food, their supplies, everything. Uh, finally, the Mounties stepped in, uh, took women and children off the boats. They allowed only skilled pilots to run these rapids. Yet most of the inexperienced boatmen on their self-built boats managed somehow to negotiate the dangerous whitewater. Edison's film crew recorded this barge surviving the Whitehorse Rapids. For those who survived, there were some last moments of peace before the next battle. Now it was just a few more weeks to Dawson, the city of gold. While Harvey Condon and tens of thousands like him had been killing themselves to reach Dawson, hundreds of Dawson's residents were fleeing, trying to escape to the outside. An early freeze had trapped food and supplies downriver, and the town was staring at starvation. Only two years earlier, Joseph Ledoux had seen the opportunity created by Carmack's discovery. Anticipating the coming gold rush, he built a sawmill and saloon right where the Yukon and Klondike rivers met. Ledoux platted a town and named it Dawson City for George Dawson, the famous Canadian surveyor. Sitting at the foot of some of the richest ground ever discovered, Dawson City had more gold dust millionaires than anywhere on Earth. But that was all she could boast about. Dawson was just 165 miles from the Arctic Circle, freezing cold in the winter, flooding in the spring, disease and devastating fires year-round. People were starving. Um, they had to eat the dogs uh, because they couldn't feed the dogs. A miner could dig $14,000 worth of gold out of the ground in the morning, and in the evening couldn't even afford a, a bad meal. There's a scene in a Charlie Chaplin movie, uh, The Gold Rush, in which he's eating his shoelaces. 
Like the little tramp in Chaplin's famous scene, people in Dawson couldn't buy food that wasn't there, no matter how much gold they had. The price of salt was equal to the price of gold, an ounce for an ounce. The Stampeders didn't know about the starvation. They had heard all the tales about Dawson being awash with gold, but most of them simply had no idea what the miners had been through to get that gold. Gold miner John Gould. Well, my father came up here on this hill in 1903, did a little prospecting and liked what he found and staked his claim, and we've been working it ever since. Uh, Peter is a third generation on this hill. Now, it's all hard work today as well as it probably was in those early days, you know. The, I imagine they came up here in hopes that they could just pick it off the ground and put it in their pocket and go home wealthy. But they found that it was very hard work. Long before the first stampede headed north, the Klondike prospectors were working through the bitter winters, the setting fires to thaw the permafrost, then digging up the frozen muck. Once you sink your shaft and you finally get down to the pay gravels and you take out a, a large dump, they call it, of gravel with gold in it, and you didn't really know what you had until uh, spring when the snow melted and the water started to run and you were able to sluice your dump. Sluicing meant combining your pay dirt with water and running it through long chutes called sluices so the heavy gold would separate from the rest of the sand and gravel. They use the same method today. And yet for all their work, some miners found they weren't even working on their own claims. Everybody was allowed a 500-foot claim on the creeks in the country, and we are now pacing off 500 feet on Hunker Creek from post number one to post number two. We drive the post into the ground, and we go into town and we record our claim. But then you must remember that everybody's stride is different, so sometimes the claim was too long or sometimes it was too short, and that created a mess when it came to the survey in later. Mess is an understatement. Six months after Carmack's discovery, the claims in the Klondike were a hopeless jumble. In desperation, the miners turned to one man, William Ogilvy. Ogilvy was the Canadian government surveyor who had just laid out the streets of Dawson. He had an impeccable reputation. The miners accepted his rulings as final. The stakes were incredibly high. There were situations where just a few inches, one way or another, meant tens of thousands of dollars. Where claims didn't meet properly, a strip of unclaimed land called a fraction resulted. One such fraction yielded half a million dollars in gold. But Ogilvy himself never staked a claim and never expressed the slightest regret. The rules were clear. I am a government servant and not permitted to hold property. June 4, 1898. We arrived in Dawson after a hard trip and passing many wrecks and people on sandbars in the middle whom we could not help. Harvey pulled into the new suburb made out of canvas that had sprung up on the flats just across the Klondike from Dawson. It was named for its most common resident. We landed in Laustown and managed to squeeze my tent in among the others, crowded so close that I had to tie my tent ropes to the stakes of another tent. The bulk of the Stampeders reached their fabled city of gold around June 8th. They were welcomed with open arms by the survivors of the starvation winter. That very same week, the first sternwheelers that had been trapped in the Yukon ice arrived from the coast. Dawson was suddenly flooded with every item imaginable. For just 12 months, from July 1898 to July 1899, this town was the San Francisco of the North. One year earlier, it was just a few tents and shacks. People starved. Now, it was a carnival at night, open market during the day. It had everything. Steam heat, electricity, movie theaters, running water. That is, if you had money. If you didn't, filth, squalor, and disease. Harvey Condon wrote home. August 8th. Goodness, there is a terrible smell from all over this town. 
The substitutes for patent water closets are scattered all over the brush, and the odor isn't much like a peach. The amount of sickness in Dawson is something terrible. The hospitals are crowded, and they put patients in the lower floor before the upper is finished. Three acquaintances of mine have already died, one of scurvy and two of typhoid fever. And a young fellow who helped me build my boat and came down behind me is given up to die from typhoid. There were 30,000 people jammed in here, another 5,000 out digging gold. For the people without money, it was a struggle just to survive. But if you were a stampeder with gold dust, you could buy anything. From vintage wines to Bibles, from Paris fashions to lobster Newburgh. And there was always some smart, canny businessman around to sell it to you. The smartest and canniest of all was a businesswoman. Belinda Mulrooney was one of many savvy entrepreneurs who got rich selling to the miners. She was in Juneau when she heard about the Klondike strike and was one of the first white women to cross the Chilkoot Pass. She was smart. And sold her supplies at a 600% profit, bought vacant lots, hired men to bust up packing crates and build crude houses out of wood. She took that money and built a hotel and saloon in Grand Forks, a little community that sprang up closer to the miners. And she listened to everything the miners said. She bought up claims and made the first of several fortunes. She married a man named Carboneau, who claimed to be a French count, and ultimately built herself a castle in Yakima, Washington. But Belinda Mulrooney couldn't match the wild extravagance of the kings of the Klondike. Dawson expected a man of wealth to put on a show, and the kings did not disappoint. The year before, they had nothing but gold, but once the stampede arrived, gold could buy anything. There was Arizona Charlie Meadows and Big Alex McDonald and the notorious Swiftwater Bill Gates. They built big hotels and bigger saloons. And like Swiftwater Bill, even if they were teetotalers who didn't drink champagne, they took baths in it. And who says a man can't buy love or some variation of it? At least one man married a woman for her weight in gold but most had to settle for the fantasy beyond the footlights. Many Dawson female entertainers achieved almost legendary status in town. They helped the Klondike millionaires while away the nights. Champagne flowed at two ounces of gold a bottle. Most of the Stampeders could only watch and dream. In Laustown, across the Klondike, the cribs of Paradise Alley were open for business around the clock, six days a week. The Mounties <laughs> did turn a blind eye toward some vice. That incredible summer, Sam Steele, the Mountie commander at Chilkoot, was transferred here to Dawson. He was tough, he was fair, uh, this was a law-abiding town, no guns were allowed, there wasn't even a murder the entire year. In fact, uh, most of the offenses here were things like dog stealing and disturbing the peace. Punishments were fines or chopping wood for the Mountie woodpile. For more serious offenses, you were banished from Dawson. And Sundays, this town went absolutely dead, the Sabbath. You were even fined for fishing. The worldwide sensation created by the Klondike Gold Rush made Dawson the place to be in the summer of 1898. Reporters and photographers mingled with the milling crowds of gold seekers. There was even a pair of intrepid tourists. Miss Edith Van Buren, the niece of the former president, and her traveling companion, Mrs. Mary E. Hitchcock, took a ship through the Bering Sea and arrived by paddle wheeler. They hosted elegant dinner parties, serving mock turtle soup, roast moose, anchovies, and ice cream. And some people came to Dawson just for the adventure. Nellie Cashman, a 50-year-old miner from Arizona, was a genuine frontiers woman. She became a legend with her extraordinary acts of charity. She never fell in love with gold, but she did fall in love with the Yukon. It takes real folks to live by themselves in the North. Of course, there are rascals everywhere, but up here there is a kindly feeling towards human beings and a sense of fair play that one doesn't find elsewhere. Nellie Cashman's belief in the humane power of the North was shared by everyone in Dawson one summer night, July 4th, 
1898. No one knew it then, but this was the high point of the Klondike Stampede. The thousands who made it to the Klondike had survived freezing cold and an unbelievable journey. Most of them were Americans. They'd made it, they were alive, and they celebrated Independence Day, 1898. But when the party was over, how many would actually find gold? How many would strike it rich? Most of the 40,000 men and women who came to Dawson didn't even bother to look for gold. Harvey Condon acquired this claim. It overlooks George Carmack's original discovery. And Harvey learned what the other prospectors had already found out, that most of the good claims had already been staked before the Stampeders even left Seattle. Uh, the race was over before it began. They were too late. Those who didn't turn around and head home wandered around aimlessly, lost, like sleepwalkers, just sitting on the boardwalks of Dawson. August 30, 1898. I sold my claim for $1,000. Too cheap, as George says. But remember, it was only 50 by 100 feet. I miss you and Connie and the baby so. If men like Harvey didn't leave rich with gold, what did they take home with them? For most of them, it was not bitterness nor remorse. It was something deeper. A few years after the stampede, a young bank clerk showed up in Dawson and lived in this cabin. In his spare time, he wrote poems. His verses transformed the stories of the Klondike gold rush into myth and legend. His name was Robert W. Service. I wanted the gold and I sought it. I scrabbled and mucked like a slave. With famine and scurvy I fought it. I hurled my youth into a grave. I wanted the gold and I got it. Came out with a fortune last fall. Yet somehow life's not what I thought it. And somehow the gold isn't all. They survived incredible odds. Out of the one million who made preparations for the race, only 100,000 actually left for the Klondike. They hauled a ton of supplies out of the muck and danger at Dye and Skagway. They witnessed the horrors of the Dead Horse Trail and survived the savage storms and avalanches of the Chilkoot Pass. They built their own boats, bested the rapids, and floated 500 miles down the Yukon. 40,000 survived the journey and made it all the way to Dawson, but only half of them even bothered to look for gold. Of those, maybe 4,000 found any gold at all, and only 400 actually struck it rich. And almost all of those so-called winners lost their money within a few years. Was the fever worth it? This is the White Pass and Yukon Route narrow gauge out of Skagway. This railroad put an end to Dai and the Chilkoot Trail and the Dead Horse Trail and the Golden Stairs. Uh, just a little over a year after the Palm Sunday Avalanche, you could ride a parlor car all the way to Whitehorse. That same month, they struck gold in Nome, Alaska. It emptied the streets of Dawson. The stampede moved on. And what became of the men and women who lived lifetimes in those two short Klondike years? George Carmack, the original discoverer, invested his gold wisely and died quietly in bed. He left a healthy estate over which his second wife and daughter fought bitterly. Robert Henderson, the man who refused to mine with Indians, spent the rest of his life looking for gold and not finding it. Skookum Jim lived the life of a prospector the rest of his days and left a trust fund for Indian education. The Skookum Jim Friendship Center is very active today in Whitehorse. Tagish Charlie built a large house in his hometown of Tagish, but got drunk one Christmas and drowned in the river below it. Erastus Brainerd, the ingenious PR man who promoted Seattle and Klondike fever, died in a mental hospital in 1922. Soapy Smith, the uncrowned king of Skagway, was Grand Marshal of the 4th of July, 1898 parade. Four days later, he and Frank Reed, the law-abiding civic leader, squared off and shot each other. Soapy Smith died on the spot. Frank Reed, 
died a couple of weeks later. Sam Steele of the Mounted Police, whose strictly enforced gun ban saved many lives, went on to become a general and a knight. William Ogilvie, the honest surveyor who never staked a claim, retired on his government pension. Clarence Berry invested wisely and began a financial empire that still exists today. Belinda Mulrooney Carbono's husband was killed in the First World War. She retired to her castle in Yakima, Washington, but outlived her fortune, dying poor in 1967 at the age of 95. Harvey Condon left the Klondike without any gold, but returned to Nome, Alaska a year later with an unsuccessful venture selling sheep to miners. He disappeared from the history records, dying quietly in 1933, a rancher in Washington State. And in the gold fields of the Klondike, $50 million in gold is still being washed out of the pay dirt each year. Well, my father was on the hill here, and then I took over from him. And now my son is running the operation, and with any kind of luck, another Eight years, it'll be here uh, a whole hundred years. The gold is still here in the hills and streams. Of course, Klondike crazy uh, is long since over. The Stampeders who came up here were looking to get rich. Uh, as it turned out, though, for most of them, the journey wasn't about gold. It was about themselves, what they were made of, what they were capable of doing. Most of them went back to ordinary lives, and no one would ever be able to convince them again of the idea, you can't. They'd been there and done it. They'd been up the mountain, over the summit, down the river, shot the rapids. They knew that they could dream any dream and make it happen. For Rediscovering America, I'm David Hartman.